Good morning and welcome to the 132nd virtual bridge session. It's almost a year since we started these indeed. And the relationship between the digital and the physical world is something that uh, we've had cause to think about <clears throat> over the past year. I'm pleased to have with us today Duncan Peverdy of Learn From Anywhere, um, who's going to be talking about bridging the physical and digital with new hybrid learning spaces. And he's coming to us directly from City of Glasgow College, where he's involved in installing uh, some new space, which you'll no doubt tell us about. Duncan, over to you. I will, I will. Thank you, Jason, for that introduction. But here we go. Can we all see that? Well, I picked I picked a little bit of music from um, a country star called Nath well, star called Nathaniel Rateliff. It's it's a piece of music called Time Stands, and I enjoy a very wide range of different music genres. And I've got a favourite country band called the Avett Brothers, who are, I think take a little bit of getting used to. But during lockdown, and there's a there's um, a couple of fittings with lockdown and different styles of learning here as well. But during lockdown, I got a notification that <clears throat> they were part of a benefit concert that was being streamed from Colorado in the, in the States. And it was in aid of the people whose jobs were being displaced by the pandemic. So the, the road is the lighting people, the sound people, you know, you know how it works in America. You lose your job. There's no benefits and stuff like that. That all happened. So this was streamed at the end of May. And this concert opens with this guy, Nathaniel Rateliff, I'd say I'd never heard of before. And he's performing a solo uh, acoustic song called Time Stands in an empty Red Rock Theatre amphitheatre. He's the only person you see. You can't even see any cameramen or anything there. And this place normally has nine and a half thousand people in it. It's an open air venue. Uh, people will know of it because you two have played there and the Beatles and the Rolling Stones. Everybody's played there. But it's just this guy and his guitar. And so it echoes because of COVID-19, because, of course, all the music venues everywhere are closed. And um, and and this concert was to try and help that some money for the music industry uh, survives and should there you know right now i don't feel like getting on a plane again but should that time come and, and everything then having seen this i'm you know top of top of my music to-do list now is to go and see the red rock amphitheater i don't really bother who's playing there but i'd love to go and see that when it's full of people and if i can combine that with a trip to vegas then that'd be great as well but from the so from the perspective of the move online, and I think this applies to both um, the world of education and the world of work, then I think time stands is a great metaphor for where we are today, because I think we've passed the point of emergency online teaching, and now we're looking at innovations that are pointing towards this hybrid um, learning situations that Kenji mentioned earlier, and you know are these going to now become a part of hybrid working and learning moving forward or when this is over are we going to just slip back to to how things were you know we know that some of the policy makers and the senior leadership teams haven't really embraced this hybrid learning yet um, everywhere as part of a permanent solution and you know they're going to have on their risk register you know there could be another pandemic this could be the way that we tackle climate or help towards tackle climate change um and equally, there's many who don't want to return to that insistence of being at school or being at college or being at university. Yes, some people actually find it much better. Um, I spoke to Jason a couple of weeks ago and he'd got some examples of the students that really have flourished by being at home and not being forced into that situation. So there's been some positive outcomes as well. So for me, this time stands as well as being a really, you know, when this guy's singing it in this empty amphitheater, it's fantastic. But it is a question, really. Do we want to go back to how things were or do we want to move forwards and evolve practices that I think you know, have the opportunity to be more student centric? So that was sort of my music bit and what I'm you know, going to sort of talk to you about today as well. So for those that don't know me, um, I've been around in Haiti doing, doing learning spaces um, developments for a long time. Um, there's a little picture of the roadshow that we used to run. We used to create a pop-up classroom and put it on campus for a month and get lots of people in, interested in actually hands-on using these types of spaces. And after that, we've written a couple of um, books on learning spaces. I think somebody was mentioning at the beginning as well. So before COVID started, I'd, I'd started to have an interest in these remote classrooms that are sort of starting to come into their own. And this one here is the Barco virtual classroom. Um, it's got some 
pros and cons to it in that it's um, you've got a great student interaction. The students have their own cameras and sound on each of those screens. So they're getting a view of the room in a, that makes it more like they were actually physically in a space. But it's massively expensive. You know, that room you're looking at there is, you know, half a million pounds. It's, it's, it's you know, you can't scale that. It was OK for doing executive MBA education, but to try and scale it to cope with what we've we've had to to, to go through in the last 12 months just isn't possible and there's nothing else you can do with it you can't put a powerpoint on those screens you can't do it you know you, you, you can't you you can have students appear there as part of a hybrid learning but you can't use the screens to show them anything or to put or to put a zoom on you have to learn how that system works and that's all that happens and that's the same with the other systems that are out there like the mash me and x20 there's a few different systems out there they're all massively expensive but they are starting to gain a bit of traction here's one at the um this is at Western College. Um, they're part of an institute of technology. They've just got this one up and running. So there's no real data yet about how they've used it. But, you know, there was an opportunity there. It's, again, before the pandemic, we thought, how could how could we get more? Um, they're a very rural location on the on the coast in Somerset. A lot of their students are inland. They maybe have an hour, hour and a half to travel. So could we, could we start to offer more for uh, part-time students by having a really good engagement, but not having to do all that travel for a for, for a short class um they're one of the colleges throughout the uk that offer offender training could we start to see some differences there and there's some real interest in that as well but to say it is an expensive system um but it does it, it does have that so i started um i've got a conversation going with intel they're really interested in trying to do something here and all these people you're going to see on the screen now, certainly ones on the top line, they're all partners of Intel, ViewSonic and Kramer. And we started working, could, could we collaborate and create something that was that gives us the benefits of the barcode system, but without the cost? Could we base it on standards rather than a bespoke system? Because then we can reduce the cost and we can increase usage and we can, we can probably use it in different scenarios. So... For example, you know, this is this this is what we've come up with. And this is pretty much what we've got here in City of Glasgow College at the moment. Two screens that can act as two screens or we can act as one screen. So what if we could put our Zoom call right across there? And the, and the, now we can see our students in a much meaning, more meaningful way. We can see whether they're engaged. We can see their body language. We can possibly see if they're understanding things. Uh, far more than just seeing those same images on a small laptop or desktop screen. Um, so this big screen area is what we're trying to get at. The original development was going to use projectors and have a blended image, but we soon found out there was a few reasons why that wouldn't work particularly well. So we've gone for two screens because if we use one big projector image that wide, it would have to be too big to fit in the standard classroom. So that's why we went for that. And we think this will get, you know, this, this integration will get better. We're just in a development stage at the moment still. But that means we could use those two screens. Admittedly, that was the, an image here of the projector where it was one screen. But we could use those two screens now to as one canvas, fully interactive across both screens. So we could do things like, you know, STEM or any sort of writing across there. We can have students use our own devices to connect up and share information. Um, whether, and again, that could be in class or remote. This, you know, we've, the technology allows those students to be anywhere. And the great thing is that if you're sat off campus, you can see what's on that screen back on your own device. So, yeah, it would be a little bit small. You might have to pinch and zoom and, and move the screen across, but you can see it and you can take part in it. So this is what we built um, We've got it on a height adjustable stand. We've we've uh, not mounted it on the wall, so let's say it's height adjustable. It also means that in this particular environment where I'm in today, you know, we we have no facility to no opportunity to mount it on the wall here anyway. So we we've, we've got that. Um, we've got our large writing space. We can put anything onto there. Um, doesn't matter whether the students are here or remote or a mixture of the two. But one of the one of the things that is really key to these environments is that it's simple to use. So can we use it now you know, with the things that we're already used to, like the Zoom and Teams and even a PowerPoint? You know, I've played around with creating a, a very wide PowerPoint template that goes across those two screens. You know, I've got lots of room to put some information up, but also then capture what students are saying or you know, to capture that on there. So it's just thinking slightly differently. But ease of use is important. So here's the lectern that's driving it. We've got a visualizer that, you know, there's a little six button control on there. We can just press a button to bring up the visualizer. You can see the cables for a laptop. I can put the lap, I can just walk up my laptop, HDMI and USB it, and I can and we don't want people to stand behind that lecture. We want to come out, but they can then drive that interactively from the screen using all the touch on there as well. And I can have that as one canvas, which is sort of on there at the moment, or I can have two separate um, sources of information on there if, if, if I want. So 
say in terms of ease of use, just connect up, just push a button, away we go. It's 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 very straightforward. And really, what we're trying to do with these with these hybrid sessions of having students in in two places, we're trying to give the students that are not here the same sense of belonging as if they were here, because we know that you know we know that a learning space really works well when you've got your got that fusion of what you're trying to do academically and pedagogically you're trying to develop social and personal skills and um, that's what we want on campus so can we can we create that for those students that are, are not on campus as well and that's where you know that's where the you know the barco system and I was, I was talking with Kenji just before we started about there's been some research done in Belgium at a university there where they've been using these hybrid systems for a couple of years and it's been very positive <clears throat> and it's cut down a lot of travel you know, and and I heard some I heard some experiences of while we've been here the last couple of days at the college here. You know, some of the benefits of being able to, to to use hybrid a lot more and use people remotely. And one of the things that's happened over the last twelve months is is that culture change within all of us. We're all now more accepting of situations over video that are not perfect. We you know we it doesn't have to be top quality. So to bring you know, and you even see it in you know news night and places like that where they bring people in now who would have been in the studio before, but now they're coming in from their home on a on a Zoom or Teams call, and the quality's not brilliant, but we're all accepting of it. But that of that ability to bring people in remotely, um, there's a student that was we were talking to yesterday who's doing bakery here. They could bring some specialists in. They hadn't got to bring them up to the college. They could just put them in front of a camera. They could show them what they're doing through the camera. And it was really impactful having like a leading expert in some sort of sugar creation um, to, to, to have been there, which they wouldn't have got them up into Glasgow. So there's, there are benefits to it. But we need to be mindful, you know, and it isn't it isn't plain sailing because we know there's questions about digital poverty and connectivity and what devices are people have got. And it all plays a part. But at least now we've got those conversations around that going. So, you know, pedagogy has to come first. We have to have technology that enables that. And, you know, these are some of the things that, you know, I think are absolute givens. You have to have ease of use. Other people will not use it. We've seen that, you know, for years and years. <clears throat> the connected connectivity to those digital devices and i think again uh, i think one of the um i think 5g is going to make that massive difference to that moving forward you know, being able to connect on mobile phones that you know, so many students got mobile phones haven't necessarily got laptops and ipads and and again making sure that everything we design <clears throat> and um has that has, has that accessibility and inclusion built in from day one that's got to be an absolute given as well and again if we can create spaces that give that better sense of belonging um, and have technology that allows, you know, Zoom I know allows breakout groups and, and things like that. But it's great. It's about, well, some of the things that we do on campus now, do we have to do them on campus? Could they be done remotely? So when people come onto campus, it's for it's for other things. It's not necessarily for the didactic teaching. We could do that re you know, remotely. But what if they come on to do the collaborative stuff in small groups? What if they come on because that's where their support is and where their clubs and societies and, and different things are? And, and we've already seen that people like Faulkner Brown's big architect Architectural practice down in uh, Newcastle, they've started talking about repositioning the campuses again. Okay, the new campus designs, those big lecture spaces have, have pretty much gone. Um, it's only where there's some need for specialist areas, you know, engineering, medicine, that you're going to have those types of environments. But they're going to change as well. They won't just be didactic, there will be very much uh, more engagement in those spaces as well. So, you know, the, the danger is, and I come back to my, I start off telling you about time stands, everything. You know, are we going to, where are we, where are we standing in this time now? What's going to happen? Are we going to go back to how things work? Because I know I hear people saying, oh, I can't wait till it all goes back to normal and it, it's just normal. You know, there's no, there's no adoption of or recognition of that some of these things are better and can be better. Or are we actually going to embrace these things and, uh, and evolve them as well? And, I also want to say, what well, just while I'm up here, you know, in in Scotland as well, in, is that um, the guys helping me put this together here for City Guys at College of Stream Tech, they, they they do know what they're doing with this, and they're very um, been, been really attention to details, been brilliant. So if anybody you know wants to learn a bit more about what we do, we will start putting it up on the Learn From Anywhere website. Now we've got some proper photos instead of just artist impressions, but you can reach out to their MD directly, or again you can contact me if you want to you know, know more about what we're doing here but 
but it's it is very much um it's very much a development state a development piece here it's not a like here we are buy this kit and get on with it it's about how can we work with you to to bring in more hardware or software um that can actually help in in, in that hybrid provision and these these manufacturers here i you know, want to recognize them as well because they've been instrumental in working and changing some of the ways they work and not being precious about it because normally some of these companies would want you to have just their solution you know and, and not not look at a bigger better picture so that's that's been really positive as well and then just again to make people aware it's not part of a standard visual learning lab but because of the input from intel we've we've just also into this installation put in a um a video observation system so we've got a camera that looks at the students it can sense yeah, we can ask it to do all sorts of things. We can ask it to make sure social distancing is being practiced, so they're not all sat you know, right next to each other. But it's to it's it's with a view to to looking at their in, engagement and understanding. It can also detect um, levels of well-being, and at the moment it's an anonymous system, so it ca it captures people's images, it makes those recognitions, it captures the data from them, but it doesn't associate it to a particular named person, and then it deletes those images. They get deleted almost immediately. Immediately. So all the GDPR things have been ticked and everything. And then we can look at that dashboard of data of you know, what the engagement levels were and attention and all these things. Um, so it's a starting point. So, you know, we're going to use it as trying to try and do a little bit of research here and see, how, see if it has a part to play. Um, we know that you know, these systems are being used in the Far East and there's a, a lot of question marks over, you know, are they force for good or for evil? You know, they, are they controlling people? Um, because, of course, if, we th if, if the system could detect there was a well-being issue, we couldn't do anything about it because you to do something about it, you have to identify it so you could make an intervention. And we're not doing that at this moment in time. The system can absolutely do that. So just, you know, if anybody's got any interest there, I'm sure, you know, City Glasgow College will be interested in that, working with people as well. But it's, it is very much just a little sideline of it, but it's something that we're, you know, that they're, they're happy to have on. So that's, that's what we're doing. That's what, we've, that's what this visual learning lab is, is about. Um, there are some, there are going to be some other developments coming very quickly off the back of this. So this is a little bit, we, we haven't got an exact price on this yet. We'll probably have it in the next seven days because we've just been, say, putting it in and working out all the things we do and don't need. But we're going to we're going to be bringing out a version that doesn't need brand new screens on a mount. That's, you know, the mount is very expensive. What if you've got a good interactive projector in a space already? Could you put that into a room and have these benefits? And we think that'll be we think that'll be sort of less well around about nine thousand pound a room to do that to have all that connectivity and and the, the cameras and the visualizer and the podium um and we're looking at an even even um, more value for money one for for, for um primary and secondary school as well because there's been a interest in that and then there are people who want the the barcode style uh, but don't want to pay the price for it. so we're looking at something that will just do that as well and we believe that's going to be around about the thirty thousand pound mark so that's exciting because that's you know a massive difference and potentially more scalable and we'll just as always we're looking for partnership we partner with the city of glasgow here um you know that they've 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 had a lot of benefit in being a partner with us that's what i say so it, it's, it's good so um yeah so i hope that's been of interest um i'm just going to go back to the picture of what we've got here which is there there it is we've got the two screens and the lectern but you know if anybody's got questions i don't know if that's our format for this but i'll need to it's take some yeah, so uh, and I'll invite uh, the audience to save Duncan being peppered by the eight questions or so that I've got. Oh. <laughs> Coming in first. Um, I I could just ask um a quick question, and it was one one you actually raised yourself just before we started this meeting. So it's the visibility of the students who are joining remotely, and you were you were describing the kind of situation where, where do you position those students in terms of making them visible to the lecturer? And you suggested like one option might be to place them at the back of the room so that they are in amongst, as it were, the, the students that the lecturer is speaking towards. Um, what, what, what are your thoughts around that? What, what kind of solutions are available? Um, I, th I, th 
going to share that research with you later from Belgium, but I think that research was inconclusive. I think it's more down to a personal choice of how you want that room to be. But technology, of course, will allow us, because if, if, if you've got it arranged as you, the first way you described, so that the academic, the tutor is seeing all the students together because the students coming in remotely on, or on screens behind them, um, then, um, then there's, or clearly the students who are in the room can't see the students that are not in the room unless they're cricking their necks round, and then they're not going to have a good view because those screens are going to be so close to them. But those screens, there's a cost involved, of course, but what's on those screens behind the students could also just be duplicated to the front of the room as well. So, the, so then the students who are both in the room and remotely will see those screens at the front and see all the students together as well. I'm not sure if anybody's done that. So as this, as part, as this is part of a development space and we can use this for in class, remote or hybrid, the let we've we've yeah, just a little thing to help here. We've 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 got a new lectern development here that actually that actually moves through 90 degrees. So this lectern could be placed a little bit further out from the wall and there. And then when it's a remote only session, uh, the tutor can turn and face the the, the students who are remote and, and when it, it's just in class they can turn the other way so that's one of the things we want to find out I, you know at the moment the feeling here is that we're going to arrange the students so that they are um they are looking at the screens themselves you know and any students coming in but that's part of that's part of what this space is and what the tom duff and his team here want to do they want to try and see is there any benefit in one or the other excellent thank you uh walter are you able to ask the question yourself or would you like me to put it on your behalf no, sh that's fine, Jason. I just wondered if if you're only at the proof of concept stage, or do you have particular faculties engaged? You talked about bakery a moment ago, but just are there are there specific faculties who've shown a real interest in this? It's still the proof of concept stage. Um, definitely, we haven't had that engagement with specific departments here. I've got, I've got other, I've got universities who are interested in this at the moment, but it is just so. so it is for them. We've we've deliberately given it the name of visual learning lab to to give it that feeling that it is development and it's exploration. And it isn't just a finished product. And we think part of the reason mm -hmm. behind that is because that is exactly what it is at the moment. And then I'm talking to some. I'm talking to a couple of people about having some software that's um, from an education point of view, probably better than Teams or Zoom and what it will do and the engagement and everything else and see whether we can incorporate in that. So there's those developments that come and, you know, because it's a Windows standard based system, I'm sure other people will, who will come up with things we've never even thought of. And we want to enc you know, encourage that as long as it, as long as it retains that ease of use for people then that'd be good so yeah it is very much still it's a little bit beyond proof of concept but it is still experimental given the huge investment in colleges like city of glasgow in existing digital projection for all of their teaching spaces um that 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 seems to me would be a, an indicator that to try and maximize that resource would be a a useful thing to do well i hope that's one of the things that can come from this because once people you know it's, it's again talking about things in concept is all well and good but if people can see this and they say oh, do you know what instead of having because you know the the motorized lift that takes two screens that will take up to 200 kilos that is a big bit of kit it's an expensive bit of kit if you right. if you if you've got a, a, a really good epsom or a, a, and i've got a lot of epsom projects here um already in class then actually why don't we use that as the display let's put an interactive display on a, a lectern and, and we've developed it's not quite at the ready for ready for market but we're a couple of weeks away we've had somebody develop a lectern that is much lower cost because we're aiming at the fe and the school sector with that a touch panel on that so now your epson projector if it already isn't touch it becomes touch and again if we've got the, we're using the kramer ver system here but that allows that allows people to, to contribute to see things on their own display to bring in people remotely so i say i think in those instances where they've already got a good projection system in the room you could now transform that room for i, I say i think it's going to be somewhere around about nine thousand pounds fully installed for all that kit okay. and, the, and the bit which and i think this one here with because of the, the frames and the, and the more expensive lectern and we've got two um we've got two displays on the lectern that are mirroring what we already have i think this is going to be more towards thirty thousand hmm. pounds 
but it's still a massive drop than the half a million you pay for a barco system. <laughs> and and it, but it's different. Like you can't compare the you know, the two directly against each other. But but yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hey, Graham, do you have any questions you want to come in with? Um, no, Comments or reflections? There's a question as such, but I've, I've been in a situation where I've got the, the students in the class and on the screen, and it was a case of, yeah, who do, who do I face? You know, when, I, when I'm speaking to the class, trying to address them as, and, you know, when I'm teaching, um, you know, I'm, I'm turning and looking at the students in the class and then I'm aware that I've got my back to the board, <laughs> to, to the screen, and the students are there. And you, it's just difficult. Um, you just feel kind of awkward and just try to stand to the side scenario and speak to everybody. <laughs> Well, that's that's an interesting, and it's, it's a little bit of an overlap with what we said with Kenji. But there's looking at another scenario because I've had this exact requirement from a, actually from a secondary school um, to create an environment like that, and it, and so the idea where they're going to have you know again some remote and some in class, and the and and to keep the costs low because they'll want to they'll want to you know roll this out across a, a large number of rooms is to actually have a confidence monitor up on the ceiling from the ceiling in front so you're looking out into your classroom you've got your physically present students there and then just above you you've got the remote students probably on a 55 or 65 inch screen and a little camera below that which is that which is now what the remote students are seeing they're seeing you from that and yes you're going to turn around and write on your board or, or do something but that would happen in a class anyway if they were yeah. all there that's that's going to happen so we're looking at trying to do something like that and and i've got a real eye on you know how can we make that cost effective and and useful as well you know it's no point being cost effective and not being very uh, actually very efficient to do it we need to have that you know somewhere between the two and I can't deny Kenji coming in. <laughs> just, just one very quick question about the flexibility of spaces and mics. So lecturers typically like to stand um, and present and, and may do for practical purposes as well. So and with places like City of Glasgow College, which have large open spaces, how do you work with mics to get the best audio back to the students? This is a development room. <laughs> So I actually thought so there was a little bit of a misunderstanding because I thought we were going into an enclosed classroom here, but we've actually got on our uh, on our um, across the top of our two monitors we have got a microphone array. So in other words, it'll pick up now. It'll pick up. It'll it will pick everything up that's in this space here, which is quite a big space. The the unknown at the moment is what it will do when there's a, when there's a lot more students here. At the moment, there's only a few hundred students here. So when there's a couple of thousand students in this building and there is lots of noise, how's that going to cope? We don't know. We may have to go back to using a lapel mic, but the, but we know we know that people don't like using lapel mics, or they, you know, in in all cases, because the, this microphone array, if we're on a Zoom to call with another location it should pick up everybody in the room not just the academic if a student wants to contribute it does that and that saves you know there's obviously people don't want to pass microphones around from person to person at the moment because of covid and and things so yeah so it's again it's something we're looking at we we're using here an acoustic magic um unit which is six or seven hundred quid there's there's the nereva nereva ones out there that are very well thought of you know but they you know some of them are fifteen hundred two grand for that so again there's a like how much money do you want to throw at a space because if you you know we could do everything if you if somebody wants to develop a space for and they've got a million pound budget we'll make it work perfectly but I, we want to be realistic we've got to make this affordable for colleges and you know the universities have always been able to afford things that, that may change it a little bit but you know we've got to have a bit of realism here I mean, so um, unfortunately, it sounds as if we've got the the uh, death for the moment of the furry microphone box or football being thrown around <laughs> the classroom that was yeah. in the past. And um, that brings us to a, a half an hour. And so at this point, uh, as is traditional in Virtual Bridge, we will bring the recording to an end with a thanks to Duncan for some very thought-provoking uh, uh, material on what um, a visual learning lab might look like. <laughs>